Stupid comment of the day goes to Jill Biden, the greatest doctor of all time. She, of course, is an incredible doctor. If you have some sort of gunshot wound or perhaps a heart attack, she can heal you with recommendation for an education degree. So she was speaking the other night at the Human Rights Campaign. Well, she went to the HRC where she immediately compared people who are trying to ban pornographic books for children to Nazis. And th this is the game that Democrats constantly play. It is going to backfire on them. It really is. History teaches us that democracies don't disappear overnight. They disappear slowly, subtly, silently. A book ban, a court decision, a don't say gay law. Before World War II, I'm told, Berlin was the center of LGBTQ culture in Europe. One group of people loses their rights, and then another, and then another. Until one morning you wake up and you no longer live in a democracy. Oh, so the Nazis are coming. So first of all, there is no don't say gay law in Florida. I know, because I'm in Florida. Watch this, gay. Where are the stormtroopers coming to take me away? They're nowhere, because that, that's stupid. It's nonsense. And as far as her lie, that books are being banned in the state of, I can get any book I want in the state of Florida because the First Amendment still applies here. All that Ron DeSantis and the legislature here did is said that you can't put pornography in front of children in school libraries. But that's too much for Jill Biden. And this sort of language, they're busily telling people that they have to have pornography in school for their kids, but they won't fix the crime problems. Yeah, good luck in the election come November. Does it make sense that a single internet company controls 90% of internet searches, runs your email service, and then can also track everything you do on your smartphone. Big tech, it's more powerful than most countries. They profit by exploiting your personal data. Put a layer of protection between your online activity and these tech juggernauts with ExpressVPN. When I run ExpressVPN on my device, the software hides my IP address, making it harder for big tech to trace and sell my activity to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of my internet data to protect me from hackers and eavesdroppers on my network. What I like most about ExpressVPN is how easy it is to use. Download that app on your phone or computer, tap one button, and you're now protected. So stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your information. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben Shapiro Show. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben Shapiro Show to get three extra months for free. I keep myself safe online by using ExpressVPN. You should do the same. Head on over to expressvpn.com slash Ben Shapiro Show right now to learn more. The Supreme Court held a big hearing yesterday on access to the abortion pill. So this case isn't actually about states trying to ban the abortion pill from being distributed within states. That presumably will be brought up in a later Supreme Court case. This is a different case. This is a case about whether the abortion pill, Mifipristone, can actually be approved by the FDA on an expedited schedule. That is what this particular case is about. According to the Wall Street Journal, the Supreme Court appears likely to preserve access to the abortion pill following arguments on Tuesday in which justices suggested protecting doctors who oppose abortion was not enough justification to roll back access to the drug. So the question here was a question of standing. Can doctors actually sue on their own behalf in order to reverse the decision-making process of the FDA? That's the real question here. Several justices focus their questioning on whether doctors and medical associations that actually have standing. These doctors and groups don't actually prescribe the abortion pill. They don't perform abortions. They have no legal obligation to help women actually perform abortions. So Brett Kavanaugh, who of course was on the correct side of overruling Roe versus Wade, he said, just to confirm under federal law, no doctors can be forced against their consciences to perform or assist in an abortion, correct? And the Solicitor General for the government, Elizabeth Prologar, she said, yes, we think the federal conscience protections provide broad coverage here. So again, these doctors were suing, saying that there might be an emergency that arises from the FDA's decision to greenlight the abortion pill on an expedited schedule. That might lead to further emergency situations in which doctors, because of emergency law, are forced to actually deal with the aftermath of the abortion pill gone wrong. And the justices are saying, well, that's a bit of a stretch. You're not talking about a contingency based on a contingency. The Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an excellent group, they brought this case on behalf of doctors and medical associations that oppose abortion. Because these pills can be sent through the mail and then self-administered, anti-abortion groups fear that Mephipristone can help women flout abortion laws in various states. Erin Hawley, who's Josh Hawley's wife, the senator, she's a lawyer for the ADF. She won a lower court ruling reimposing restrictions on Mephipristone that had been in place from 2000 when the FDA first approved the drug to 2016. That is when the agency said that research said that the rules could safely 
be relaxed. And so the question was whether this was a violation of the FDA rule, whether a court could review that based on a lawsuit brought by doctors and medical associations. This case is really more about legal standing to sue as opposed to whether, say, a state could ban the importation of mifepristone into the actual state. Justice Gorsuch questioned why the case should affect anyone other than the doctors involved. He said, this case seems like a prime example of turning what could be a small lawsuit into a nationwide legislative assembly on an FDA rule. Hawley said it would be impracticable to limit a court order to protecting the individual plaintiffs. The unpredictable nature of emergency room work meant the doctors would still risk encouraging, encountering rather, a mifepristone patient. So again, th- this happens to be a fairly weak case. Justice Samuel Alito, who wrote the original opinion, obviously, in Dobbs, overturning Roe versus Wade, questioned whether the FDA deserved the kind of deference it was being granted. He asked if the FDA had ever approved a drug and then pulled it after discovering safety problems. Lawyers for the agency said that both the agency and the manufacturer monitored the drug use and would take action if risks emerged. And then Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson said, you asked if the agency is infallible. I'm wondering about the flip side which is do you think courts have specialized scientific knowledge with respect to pharmaceuticals? Again, there are kind of two issues. One is if the FDA explicitly for political reasons fast tracks a drug like an abortion pill, can that be sued upon? Or is the FDA basically ironclad? Alito is right on that particular issue. The FDA's decisions should not be ironclad and it should be subject to questions as to whether the FDA actually went through its properly prescribed process where they can shortcut their own process. The standing question is a different issue. And the standing question, it seems like these doctors have a fairly weak case. And so in all likelihood, the the current FDA regulations will be upheld, not on the grounds that the FDA regulations are particularly good, but on the grounds of standing. I understand that's a little bit legally specific, but that is, in fact, what the case is. It is not about broadening, quote unquote, abortion rights, which is the way the media are going to treat it. Meanwhile, the city of New York continues to grapple with massive crime, According to the New York Times, in one evening barely an hour apart, Mayor Eric Adams has been confronted with two tragic events that crystallized some people's persistent fears about New York City. Shortly before the mayor announced the shooting death of police officer Jonathan Diller from a hospital in Queens, the police confirmed a man had been fatally pushed into the path of a subway train in an unprovoked attack in Manhattan. The two episodes underscored the defining challenge of Mr. Adams' mayoralty as he has tried to improve public safety and boost the city's recovery from COVID. In recent months, he has said crime is down, jobs are up to drive his point home. But violence on Monday undercut that argument that the city is becoming less dangerous. Adams found himself in a familiar place on Monday night, grieving with New Yorkers over another senseless act of violence. And again, the reality is if you don't want this to happen, you need more police officers on the street and you need to unshackle those police officers to actually deal with criminals. You need to bring back things like, yes, stop and frisk and broken windows theory. The fact that New York got away from this after two decades of tamping down its crime problem is an absolutely astonishing lesson in the fact that humanity has a short-term memory of a guppy. It really is an incredible thing. All of humanity apparently has the memory span of Dory from Finding Nemo. So you'll have a complete a complete destruction of a major American city like New York City from the 1960s all the way until the early 90s. And then you will see all of that reversed by Rudy Giuliani's hard on crime policies and Michael Bloomberg's hard on crime policies. And then Bill de Blasio will step in and re-implement all of the failed policies and crime will go up and everybody will act as though they don't know how to fix this. Everyone knows how to fix this. This is a very fixable problem. When your political priors are so important to you that you refuse to look at what actually works, you are no longer a person who is fit for public office. Eric Adams was expected to put a lid back on crime. Everyone knew how to do it. And the answer was, let the cops do their job. The fact that Democrats all over America have failed to understand this simple truth is the reason why so many people are fleeing their cities. Recidivism is a massive problem. And by the way, Adams says so. He said the city is currently facing three major issues, recidivism, severe mental illness, and quote, random acts of violence. But he said the city was not out of control. Well, I mean, it is a little bit. You know how you solve all those things, by the way? It turns out recidivism can be cured by keeping people who are bad in jail because then they're not out on the streets committing crimes. Are you tired of the lies and the twists of the mainstream media talking points? Yeah, me too. Join me in my newest series, Fact, where I dismantle and bring truth to this tiring mainstream agenda. 